Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, can everybody hear me at the back? The sound's fine, good. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me today. Thank you to the Center for Jewish Studies, the university. Uh, it's a real privilege and honor to be here today. Yesterday, I was in Berlin at the Bundestag uh, for the, their memorial event for the Auschwitz uh, 70th year commemoration. And so today, for me, it's a real privilege to be here uh, to discuss uh, some of the few things that I found, but also to hear some of the stories that you know as well. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you uh, about this journey that I've been on, which has been quite remarkable. Uh, this is my great uncle Hunts, Hunts Alexander. Uh, I knew him well. He was uh, my grandmother's brother. Uh, he was the man who stayed behind at synagogue after service and would stack the chairs. He was uh, the one, when we were children, who would tell us dirty jokes. Uh, he, uh, at weddings, uh, he would organize a prank send-off. So a horse and cart or a fire engine. Once, uh, my uncle and my father dressed up as a large elephant. And my cousin and I walked behind picking up the poop. <laughs> so he was a prankster. He was a teller of tales. He was much loved. And in 2006, he died. And at his funeral, uh, an, a eulogy was given by my cousin Peter and by my father, and much was familiar. My family, they were from Berlin, they were Jewish. Uh, they left in the 30s. They came to Britain. My uncle came with his family. And then when the war started, he joined the British Army. I knew about all this. But there was one thing that I'd never heard before, one thing that was totally new to me, and that was my uncle, at the end of the war, was a war crimes investigator. He was a Nazi hunter, and that he had tracked down the commandant of Auschwitz. And I was like, what? <laughs> How is that possible? How can I not know this story? My family, we're a large Jewish family in North London. We, we see each other 10, 15 times a year for birthdays and celebrations. We know a lot about each other's lives, maybe a little too much about each other's lives. <laughs> and so, I called my father up and I said, Dad, how is this, what is this about? Is this, is this true? Is, is it possible? And he said, well, you know, there's stories, there have been rumors, but, you know, we're not so sure. You know, Uncle Hunts, he was a teller of tales. He was a prankster. So I'm a journalist, and this felt like an interesting thing I should find out about. So I called up a friend, and they said, call, call a museum in London. So I called a museum, and the lady at the front desk answered the phone and I said, listen, I have this story, it's about my uncle, he's Jewish, he's German, he was in the army, he and she just started laughing. She thought this was the most ridiculous story she'd ever heard. So I thought, okay, this, maybe this is not true. So then I, another person said, listen, there's a museum outside of London called the Intelligence Corps Museum. I'd never heard of this museum, it's near Chicksand. So I went in a blue, my blue Volvo and I drove out to Chicksands, and it's, it's actually in a military base. So I turned up at the front entrance, and I was given an ID, and I was taken to the back of the base, and there was a little house, a little hut. And at the door, Major Edwards greeted me, and he, he made me a cup of tea and some biscuits. And he pointed to a table, and he said, there is a, a folder with the official history of the arrest of the Commandant of Auschwitz. So I sat down, I had my tea, and I had my biscuits, uh, they were nice chocolate chip biscuits. And uh, I was going through these, these, these old documents. I don't know if you've looked at old documents, but they've got a kind of smell, that musty, that musty smell. I was going through these documents, and I was turning over the papers. And on the last page was a description by a Captain Cross for the arrest of the Commandant of Auschwitz. On the very back of that document was the name H. H. Alexander, my uncle, Hans Hermann Alexander. And it was one of those hair standing up in your neck moments. You know, it's like, wow, this could actually be true. And that's when I decided to, to research the story about Hunts and Rudolf, became Rudolf, and it took me six years to, to write the book. So what I'm going to do today, I'm going to tell you the story a bit like the book. I'm going to go between their two journeys. The book is a double biography of Hunts, Alexander, and Rudolf Huss. Before we go any further, let's not confuse who we're talking about. Rudolf Hess, H-E-S-S, -S, was the secretary to Hitler. He's the one who flew over to Scotland, 
who was tried who, and spent the rest of his days in the Spandau, in prison. We're not talking about him. We're talking about Rudolf Huss. So in English, it's H-O-E-S-S, or in German, H-O-Umlaut, the two dots, S-S, uh, the commandant of Auschwitz. So I'm going to go between these two stories. So first of all, we're going to start with my, uh, my family, the Alexanders. So uh, here's a picture of the Alexanders from 1917. On your left is Dr. Alfred Alexander, so my great-grandfather. He was one of the most preeminent doctors in Berlin. Uh, he was the head of the Berlin Physicians Association. He had a private practice. Some of his clients included Albert Einstein, uh, Marlene Dietrich. Uh, he was the official doctor for the Deutsche Theater. So he had a very interesting life, a very uh, impressive social circle. On the right-hand side is Henny Alexander, his wife. Uh, on the far, uh, far left is Bella, who is their first child. On the far right is Elsie, so that's my grandmother. And in the middle are the, uh, the twins, Hans and Paul. I'm not sure which one's which. It's a, it's a bit difficult to tell at that age. So Hans was the eldest. He was born 15 minutes before Paul. And they were forever known as the boys. This is where they were. They were in Berlin, uh, born 1917. Uh, they lived in West Berlin in Wilmersdorf, and they lived in this most wonderful house on the Kaiser Allee. It's now called the Bundesallee, for those who've been to Berlin. It was an, a large apartment, 22 rooms. Uh, they had a maid and a cook and a chauffeur and a cleaner and a, dry, uh, and, and a, a guy who came every week to wind up the clocks. So they had a very interesting life. Um, they had wonderful guests coming in and out of the apartment. The uh, doctor had his consultancy rooms in the apartment. This is a picture of the boys, looking very cute. Uh, I think uh, your, Hans is on the left, Paul is on the right. My, uh, my great-grandfather was a bit of an amateur photographer, so he liked to take photographs. Uh, this is them as they get older. This is another one. Uh, this is their bar mitzvah photo. So in 1930, I like the white gloves. I think that's... They, they don't look very happy, though, do they? They're, I don't think they were really looking forward to it. Has anybody been to Berlin? Have you, have you, have you, have you seen the big noise synagogue with the big uh, gold dome? So this is where they had their bar mitzvah. It was an enormous synagogue. It could have 3,000 people. Uh, they, were, they had the bar mitzvah in 1930. Uh, the family were Jewish, uh, but for them, Judaism was a religion. It was not a way of life. Uh, most of their friends were Jewish as well, but they considered themselves German first. Uh, they went to synagogue a few times a year uh, on the High Holy Days and some other days. They also sometimes went to a synagogue near their house on Fasanastrasse, which was like the local synagogue. But they didn't go very often. But what they did have, which was unusual, is they had their own family Torah. The Torah, the, the scrolls, uh, had been written or uh, uh, written in 1790. It was like a holy mitzvah. It was a, a, an honor um, to have your own Torah. And one of Hans's or his father Alfred's ancestors had commissioned this Torah. And when they'd come to Berlin, they'd offered it to the Neu synagogue and the other synagogues and as a loan, and the synagogue said, no, we don't want a loan, you can give it to us, but you, can only, uh, you, you can't loan it to us. So they kept it in the house, um, in the uh, doctor's study. During the 1930s, of course, uh, things became much more difficult in Berlin, and uh, by 1935, it became very clear uh, with the rise of National Socialism, with persecution, uh, that uh, it might be time to leave the country, Dr. Alfred Alexander, though, was convinced that they should stay, that the Germans would sort it out, that they would kick Hitler out. But then they received a phone call uh, from an old army chum who said, listen, the Gestapo is going to come and arrest you. You're such a prominent member of the Jew Jewish community. You need to leave. So very quickly, the whole family was able to get out, almost everybody. And by 1936, they were in London. Uh, this is a picture of Hans and Paul from 1940. We're just skipping ahead a little bit here. Uh, they signed up on the first day of the war to join the British Army, 1939. Uh, the British, however, didn't know what to do with them. 
Uh, they were refugees, they were German, and the British government didn't trust them. Uh, tens of thousands of refugees came from Germany, Austria, uh, some of the other Central European countries, and the British government was very worried about them. And so at first they said, thank you very much, we'll call you. A few months later they got a letter and they were invited to join what was called the Pioneer Corps. And in 1940, uh, they actually joined the Pioneer Corps, and this is them in their early years in the Pioneer Corps. Uh, my great uncle uh, was very eager to fight for his new adopted country. Okay, we're gonna leave Hans and Paul at the beginning of the war, and now we're gonna go to Rudolf. This is a picture of Baden-Baden, uh, which is near the Black Forest on the far western side of Germany. I don't know if you can see, but in the very center there's a house uh, this is their actual house that Rudolf Hurst grew up in. Uh, he was born in 1901. Uh, his family was Catholic. They were very religious. His father was quite domineering. Uh, his plan was that Rudolf would become a priest when he grew up. Uh, he didn't have many, much good to say about his father. We know this because later when he was arrested, he wrote his memoirs and he talked about his early life. When he was 14... He ran away from home uh, to join the army because by the time he was 14, it was the First World War. And he joined the army and the, at the age of 14, it's extraordinary to think now that he was so young, but at 14, he actually was, a, was accepted to join the army. And he was trained for a couple of weeks and he was sent first of all to Turkey and then he ended up fighting uh, in, around Baghdad, what we, is now Iraq, but by then, but, but then was Mesopotamia. And that's where he saw his first action, fighting against the Indians uh, and the British. And for him, it was a revelation. Uh, he really took to fighting. He took to being in the army. He really enjoyed the respect of the army, the discipline, having a commanding officer, uh, perhaps like a father figure, perhaps. And quickly, he was promoted. And he became one of the youngest officers in the German army, seeing action in Jerusalem, around Baghdad, and he uh, was injured two or three times, and at the end of the war, he uh, was a uh, sergeant. 1918, he goes back home after the war's ended, and he goes back to his family's house, and he discovers to his surprise that his uncle has sold his house, his father and mother have died, and his sisters have been sent to a convent. Now the family still expects that he's gonna become a priest, and he says, no, I don't want to do that. I've been enjoying myself. I've, 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 I found myself in the military. And instead, he, like so many veterans of the First World War, joined the Fry Corps, which was this paramilitary group, this right-wing group, who fought after the First World War. And he continued to see action, 1921, 1922, 1923. And in 1924, he and three, three of his friends killed a man who they considered to be a traitor. And for this, they were arrested uh, and they were tried. And just before he was tried, one of his colleagues, uh, and he had an agreement that he would actually be the one who served the most time. And this colleague was Martin Bormann, who ended up being Hitler's right-hand man. So now Rudolf Hoss is sent to prison for a number of years, and he's never been to prison before, and it's a shocking experience. He's, he's never experienced something like this before. And at first, he really struggles. He has what he calls prison psychosis. After a while, he adapts, and he begins to study the prison. How do the prison guards look after the prisoners? How do they try and maintain control? Later, he'll use what he learns in the prison. 1928, he's released during a general amnesty of political prisoners. He comes back to Berlin, and he doesn't know what to do with himself. His friends encourage him to join the street fighting, to become a politician, and he says, no, I'm sick of it. Uh, I just want to, uh, I want to become a farmer. He'd always, he had always loved animals, and so instead he goes out, like many young people, he goes to a farm in the eastern part of Germany. And this is the, actually the first photograph we have of him. This is part of his pass, passbook from the Ataman League, which was this league, this uh, movement of young people, this back-to-the-land movement of young people. Uh, on this farm, he has a great time, he really enjoys it, and he meets Hedvig. 
Now, Hedwig is another young person who's very committed to this uh, back to the land movement, and they become married. And this, this picture is actually their wedding photo, taken in 1929. Later, Rudolf Huss would say that this was the best time of his life. This was his golden era. Uh, they, were, they agreed that they would uh, settle down on the farm, that they would have kids, and they had two kids. And a couple of years later, uh, the, the man who was running the farm said, listen, we need to make some money. What we're going to do is we're going to set up a stable for the SS. The SS had been created. But to do that, you need to join the SS. So Rudolf Huss says, OK, I like horses. I will join the SS. So he, he applies to the SS. He gets accepted. And after he's uh, been trained, he's on a parade ground, and he's in part of a big inspection. And as part of this inspection, uh, there was Heinrich Himmler, who was there. And Heinrich Himmler had known Rudolf Huss from the years after the First World War. They knew each other. They weren't <laughs> friends. And he sees Rudolf Huss, and he says, what are you doing here? And Rudolf Huss says, well, I've just joined the SS. And, and he catches him up on his life story. And uh, Heinrich Himmler congratulates him, but says, listen, we really need you back as part of the, uh, the movement. You need to join us and come down to my new camp that I'm set up. And I want you to become a prison guard. And Rudolf Huss says, no, I'm not really interested. I, I'm, I'm a farmer. I'm enjoying that. He says, no, you need to come back now. And uh, we've set up this new camp uh, near a town of Dachau, outside of Munich. It's the first concentration camp. And I want you to become a prison guard. So Rudolf Huss goes back to his wife, and they have a conversation. And they're not sure. Later, he describes this conversation. And he, they're not convinced, but they decide to go down. And so this is the first time that Rudolf Huss learns to become a prison guard in Dachau. This is, a taken, this is a picture taken later, but this is a picture of Rudolf Huss on the right-hand side and Heinrich Himmler on the left-hand side. At Dachau, he, um, he, he becomes a prison guard. He's trained. Uh, he, he does what he's told. He's quickly recognized as somebody who will perform his duties no matter what. And he's promoted... Uh, up through the ranks very quickly. And in 1936, he goes to another camp outside of Berlin called Sachsenhausen. He's now the second in command, so he's risen very quickly through the ranks, maybe because of his connections with Martin Bormann earlier on. It's not very clear. And again, he, he, uh, he's highly uh, acknowledged. Uh, 1938, just quickly moving through the history, on the 9th of November, 1938, uh, there is a pogrom organized across Germany against the Jews, what we now call uh, Kristallnacht. One of, the, one of the synagogues that was attacked was the Fasanerstrasse synagogue in Berlin, which this is a picture. So this is uh, the Alexander family synagogue in West Berlin. You can see it was totally destroyed. One thing I didn't know when I started this research, because I'm not a historian, I'm a journalist, was on the 10th of November, 1938, so the day after the pogrom, the day after hundreds of synagogues had been, had been destroyed, many businesses, thousands of businesses had been attacked. The next day was the first time that Jews were targeted specifically for being Jews around Germany. They were arrested and taken to camps. Up till then, if, if, if Jews had been arrested, it was really because they were political prisoners, not because of their religion. So on the 10th of November, 1938, 2,000 Jews were rounded up, or at least 2,000 Jews were rounded up in Berlin, and they were taken to a camp just outside of Berlin, which was Sachsenhausen. One of the people who was arrested was the father of Hans's new girlfriend. So in London, Hans was, had just met this girl called Annelise, or Anne, uh, who was this beautiful young lady. Uh, they got on really well. Her family was still in Germany, and her father was picked up on the 10th of November and taken to Sachsenhausen. He was kept there for two or three weeks. He was very scared. He saw a lot of brutality. And at the end of three weeks, like so many other people, he was let go. But he was told, you better get out of Germany. At that stage, the German policy was really trying to push as many of the Jews out of the country. And within a few days, the, uh, Anne's family was out of Germany and back in London. 1939, again moving forward, we have the invasion of Poland, uh, the start of the Second World War. 
In 1940, Rudolf Hoss gets a phone call or is called to a meeting and he's told by his, uh, his commanding officer, uh, Richard Glucks, who's in charge of all the concentration camps, they now want to set up a new camp in Upper Silesia. The Germans called what we call Southern Poland Upper Silesia and they want to set up a new camp for political prisoners. And uh, they said to, he said to Rudolf Hoss, would you like to do it? You've done well. And Rudolf Hoss says, okay. So then he, he goes up in uh, the beginning of 1940 to Upper Silesia to a town called Oshwischen. The Germans called this, this town of Oshwischen, they called them Auschwitz. He arrives in this town and all that is there is some old Polish barracks. There's very little there. And for the first few months, he sets about restoring the barracks with a few political prisoners. And over the next few months, that's the only people who are actually kept at the prison, are political prisoners. Rudolf Hoss is given a house uh, just next to the camp. This is the, the house as it, as it looks today. We don't have a picture of the house back then. It was a lovely house. Uh, and this is his family. Uh, this picture was actually taken in 1943. Uh, so by that stage, they had five kids. You've got Rudolf Hoss at the back. On your left is Klaus with the slightly shifty looking eyes. Uh, on the right hand side is Heidetraut. On the left hand side is uh, Bridget or uh, Birgitta, uh, who I'll talk about in a second. You've got Hans Jürgen, the young man, and you've got Hedvig in the middle with Annegret, the kids. So here's a picture of the three kids in the garden of the villa. Uh, in 2009, so three years after my uncle had died, I realized I needed to do something else to write this book properly. Up to that stage, I'd really thought about it as Hans and Huss. Hans, my uncle, the, the uh, hero, the Nazi hunter, the, the Jewish victim, and Huss, the monster, the two-dimensional villain. And I realized that if I was going to tell this story properly, I had to tell it from a human perspective to really understand how does someone become the commandant of Auschwitz, what decisions are made. I need to understand what it was like as a, from a personal perspective. To do that, I had to meet his family. I had to find someone who knew him. By that stage, I had, I'd met people. I met the man who'd cut his hair uh, uh, every, every week for three years. Um, who still lives in Krakow. He said that he cut his hair, the man was nice, uh, he treated his family nice, he didn't really say very much. I'd met the American prosecutor who had interrogated him. I'd, I'd seen video testimony of people, some of the survivors who had experienced him, but I didn't know what the family felt. I didn't have that internal perspective. The problem was that no one had ever interviewed anybody from the family. In 65 years, there's no public record. I was lucky, however, and I, I saw an Israeli newspaper about uh, the grandson of Rudolf Huss supposedly trying to sell his grandfather's artifacts to Yad Vashem. So I called up Yad Vashem, and they said, well, we can't put you in touch, but we can put you in touch with the journalist. So I found the journalist, and through this, I tracked down the grandson, and a few weeks later, I was in Auschwitz with Rainer Huss, the grandson of Rudolf Huss, and his mother. This is in 2009, and it was the first time that any member of the Huss family had been back to Auschwitz. And I have to tell you, it was a very intense experience. Uh, they were very moved, they were crying, uh, they were visibly shaken by being back there. For me, the most extraordinary thing, though, were these photographs. And Rainer Huss shared the family photographs so now we see for the first time what life was like for the Huss family next to the camp. You have to understand, has anyone been to Auschwitz? Did you see where the villa was? So for those who haven't been there, the, the villa is next to, they called it the villa, the villa is next to the camp. So the garden, the wall of the garden is the wall of the camp. From the second floor window, you can see the old crematoria. So it's about 200 meters away. This picture is taken inside the garden. You've got Hans Jürgen, Annegret, and Heidetraut. Here's another picture. They're having a picnic in the garden. There's Hedvig with some of her friends. So they were living this ordinary life just a few meters.
from pain and suffering. I was then able to track down the daughter of Rudolf Huss, who, extraordinarily enough, was still living, was living, not that she was living, but extraordinarily enough, she was living in Washington, D.C., just outside of Washington, D.C. I was living nearby at that time in West Virginia, and it took me 18 months to persuade her to talk to me. She wasn't sure, she was a bit concerned. Eventually, she said she would talk to me again. She'd never spoken to journalists before, nobody knew her story. After 18 months, I persuaded her to talk to me, and she said, before you come over, just give me a call to confirm. And I thought, mm, that's a bit of a trouble. If I do that, she'll cancel. She'll say, I'm too sick, I'm too old, I'm too tired, I'm too this, I'm too that. So instead, I went to a, um, a cake shop on I Street in Washington, D.C., and I bought the biggest chocolate cake I could find. <laughs> and I went to the front door, and I knocked on the door, and I could tell by her body language that she was going to say no, but she saw the cake, and she said, oh, cake. <laughs> come inside. And we sat down inside, and I spent three hours with her. She called herself Bridget. And it was a very strange house, a very dark house. It was almost like a Hansel and Gretel, like a wooden cottage, very dark, a lot of clutter everywhere. We sat in a corner room, and she laid down. She was complaining about being quite sick. And, and next to me was a Christmas tree. It was around Christmas. And on the Christmas tree was a mauve and cream star. And I asked her about it, and she said her, her mother had made it, Hedvig had made the star. And later, she took me around the house, and she showed me her bedroom, and above her bed was the wedding picture I showed you. So she was still sleeping under the picture of her father. And I asked her about what was life like in the Huss family? What was it like to be the daughter of the Commandant of Auschwitz? And she said he would come back uh, from what she called work at the end of the day, he would read stories, he would ask about the day, they would have dinner together, they would go for boat rides on the river behind the house, they would go for walks to the kennels to feed the dogs or say hi to the dogs. I said, what was he like? What was he like, Rudolf Huss? And he, she said, he was the nicest father in the world. And I said, how's that possible? How? This was a man responsible for the murder of over a million men, women and children, many more. How is that possible? And she said, well, this is, this is the father that I knew. There was another side, but this was the father that I knew. Whoops. 1941, maybe 1942, the historians debate this. Rudolf Hoss is called down to Berlin for a historic meeting, a very secret meeting, and Heinrich Himmler tells him that it is now time to execute the final solution of the Jewish question. That's what they call it. And that very soon they'll be sending tens of thousands of Jews to Auschwitz to be killed. And that he was told to go and find a way of doing this. Rudolf Hoss goes back to Auschwitz and within a short time and he and his staff will come up with this new way of killing people in a very quick fashion by using this gas, Cyclone B, this pesticide. By 1943, they're able to murder over 2,000 people every hour. This is a very rare photograph of one of the crematoria in Auschwitz. I'm going to tell you who these, uh, these people are. Um, this is a new photograph in, in, in this slideshow. About six weeks ago, uh, I found out about these two. This is the uh, uncle and aunt of my grandfather, of my grandfather so Elsie's husband. Uh, they were deaf. They were living in Berlin. In 1943, they were rounded up at their factory, and they were put on transport 31 and transport 36, and they were sent to Auschwitz. I only found out about this about six weeks ago. Like many families, I think, many Jewish families, well, some Jewish families talked about what happened uh, during those times, and some Jewish families did not talk about it. And our family is one of those families who didn't talk about it. And it transpires that about five or six, maybe six members of the family died around this time. This is Elsa and Alfred. Oops. This is another very rare photograph. This is of the Hungarian Jews who are just uh, waiting in line just after selection. In 1943... 
December 1943, Rudolf Hoss is taken back to Berlin. He's promoted again, and he's asked to help organize all the concentration camp, the inspectorate for concentration camps. By then, there was thousands of camps. And his, uh, his so-called skills were acknowledged once again. But in 1944, he was asked to return to Auschwitz for the short term to oversee the extermination of the Hungarian Jewish population. They called this operation Action Hoss. They named it after him. And in a few weeks, in 1944, they killed over 400,000 Hungarian Jews in Auschwitz. And this is a picture from that time. In the summer of 1944, the uh, operation had been completed. And as part of Rudolf Hoss's going away party, they held a celebration. And at the very middle, you can see him kind of leaning back. That's Rudolf Hoss. He's surrounded by his friends, Mengele, Hosler, uh, Joseph Kramer, some of the main SS officers. This was a party that took place very close to the Auschwitz camp. He, Rudolf Hoss went back to Berlin, and that's where he was until the end of the war. So let's go back to Hans. This is a picture of Uncle Hans looking quite dapper with his pipe. He was very fond of his pipe. When his pipe broke, he used to send it back in a Dunlop pipe. So I have these letters of him uh, being quite anxious about his pipe, and he sent it back to be repaired. Imagine a, a pipe being repaired. He sent his pipe to be repaired by the manufacturer. Uh, this is 1945. At the end of the war, uh, Hunt was quite anxious and quite upset about his time in the war. He felt like he'd wasted his years. He's been six years in the army. For the first few years, the British did not trust him, like many of the other German Refugees, he was allowed to be in the army, but he wasn't given a gun. He wasn't allowed to fight. By the end of the war, they realized actually that they should make use of these people. And those who actually could speak German could play some service. And so he was invited to become an interpreter at the end of the war. So in May 1945, he was given some new orders. He was told to report to the interpreter's pool of a new group that had been formed the number one war crimes investigation team. Uh, by the end of the war, the British and the Americans realized that there was, they were going to have to uh, investigate war crimes, but they weren't ready in any shape or form. They hadn't nearly enough people, given the thousands and thousands of people who had been involved with the war crimes. As we heard earlier, they'd known about these war crimes since 1942. They had aerial photography of Auschwitz from 1943, 1944 but they weren't ready. They had formed one war crimes investigation team, the British, and that was, uh, Hunts was asked to be an interpreter. There was to be 12 men, that was all, for the entire war crimes effort. He uh, leaves Brussels, he drives into Germany, and he arrives at a camp that had been just uh, liberated two weeks earlier. And the name of the camp was Belsen, or Belgen, Bergen Belsen. He arrives in the camp, he has no idea what's going to happen in front of him, and when he arrives, he finds he found thousands of dead bodies on the ground. Those who were still alive were half starved. And he spent the first few days literally picking up the dead bodies and putting them in mass graves, and then saying prayers afterwards. The few days after that, he was asked to uh, help with the interrogation of the SS guards who had been arrested in Belsen. And many of these had actually come from Auschwitz. As we heard, Auschwitz was liberated in January 1945, and many of the SS guards actually ended up in Belsen. Josef Kramer, Irma Grasser, Elizabeth Volkenrath, Dr. Klein. And these were the people that Hans was asked to interrogate, uh, along with a British colleague. And so for the first time, perhaps, he was hearing directly from the perpetrators about the crematoria, about the selections, about the transports, about the gas chambers, about the murders, about the experiments. Can you imagine? He's 26, 27 years old. He has no knowledge of this, and he's hearing this directly from the perpetrators. Well, something, something shifts in Hans. He's, up to now, he's been this happy-go-lucky kind of guy. He was always a troublemaker. But something shifted. It was like a light switch being switched. He became incredibly angry and determined, and he went to his commanding officer, uh, Leo Gen, and he said, listen, anyone can interpret for you, anyone can translate, let me go and find these men and women. Let me go and hunt down some of these people. And his commanding officer said, no, you've got a job to do, do your job. 
And uh, Hunt said okay, and being Hunt, he said okay, and he walked out the door, and the next day he got a car and he went looking for the, for the Nazis. This was not a man who was good at doing what he was told. Now you have to understand, Uncle Hunt, he was not a policeman, he had no training, he wasn't a detective, he did not have powers of arrest, he did not have intelligence, he did not have uh, any backup. Uh, but he went learning. He, le he learned on the job. He, he learned that you have to interrogate people. He learned that people lie to you. He learned you go to the town hall to find a birth certificate, a marriage certificate. And by the end of the autumn of 1945, he had become the lead investigator for the first number one war crimes investigation team. Hunts is, Hunts is um, uh, told by his commanding officer that he has a new task that he needs to go and track down this man, Rudolf Huss. But nobody knows where Rudolf Huss is. By this time, uh, they'd had the Belsen trials, uh, and then they'd had the Nuremberg trial. This was in the middle of the Nuremberg trial. So they knew about Auschwitz, they knew about Rudolf Huss, but they didn't know where he was. Was he in Germany? Had he escaped? So he goes to, um, uh, Uncle Hunts goes to, to Berlin. He picks up the trail. He finds some old photographs, some press photographs. He goes to Sachsenhausen, where the concentration camp inspectorate was, and he finds out that the entire inspectorate had left Sachsenhausen in uh, April 1945 and had fled to the north, to the very north of Germany near the Danish border. And at a meeting with Heinrich Himmler, they'd come together, and Heinrich Himmler had said, listen, the jig's up. You all now need to disappear and take care of yourself. You have to take on a civilian identity and disappear. So uh, Hans goes up to nor northern Germany and he meets up with a field security section which was like a military police. They were in charge of the security of the uh, border area and he meets Captain Cross and he says to Captain Cross, listen I need to find Rudolf Hoss, do you have any ideas? And Captain Cross says, listen now, we've been looking for, for this man for months but we have no idea where he is but we do know about his wife. In fact, we arrested her a few weeks ago, and she's downstairs in the jail. So uh, Hunts goes downstairs and interrogates Hedvig. And Hedvig's not saying anything. She refuses to say anything. So Hunts goes, OK, what are we going to do? And they decide to go and find the children. So they drive over to the village where the children are staying. The children are living in an apartment above an old sugar factory in St. Michelisdon. And Hans goes into the, in the apartment and he makes the children sit on the, sit on the table and starts asking them questions. Now, I know this because this is what Bridget told me when I saw her in Washington. And she said, Hans was very angry and poking at their face. Where is your father? Tell me where he's hiding. What's his name? What alias has he taken on? And he started threatening them. If you don't tell me, I'm going to put you in prison. If you don't tell me, I'm going to take your brother away. She said it was so ferocious that she ran outside with her hands covering her ears and she hid under a tree. And for the next few decades, she said she had, she had uh, headaches. She had migraine headaches because of his, his, his shouting so badly. She said a few minutes later, she, he, she saw my uncle come out with his men and they had Klaus, the eldest son. And they took Klaus back to the prison and uh, said to the mother, Hedvig, listen, you know, we've got your son, tell us where your, husband in, uh, where your husband is. And she refused. And for the next few days, they went on hunger strike. And Hans and the men were dis discussing what should they do. And they came up with an idea, a ruse, a plan. And they backed up an old steam train behind the prison, a very noisy steam train. And Hans went up to Hedvig and said, if you don't tell me where your husband is, if you don't tell me what his name is, I'm going to send your son Klaus to Siberia, which was basically code for he would be killed, because we know what that's what would happen in Siberia. And he leaves her a, pen, a pencil and a paper, and he walks out the room and comes back a few minutes later, and she's written down the name Franz Lang and the village Gotrupel. So Hans goes up to Captain Cross, and they decide to go that night, that very night, and they load up some trucks, and they put the men in the trucks, and one of the things they put in the trucks is a box full of axe handles. Well, you don't need axe handles to arrest somebody. They had 20 or 30 men, and they drove through the night to Gotrupel, and they arrived at the little farmyard. 
at very near the Danish border, near Flensburg, about six kilometers from the Danish border. And it was snowing, and it was about 11 o'clock at night, and they stop at this, this village, at this hamlet, and Hans gets out the truck, and he walks up to the front door, or the, 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 big, um, the big farm door, and he knocks on the door, and the door opens, and it's Rudolf Huss, and he's wearing pyjamas. And the first thing that he does is he puts the gun in Rudolf Huss's mouth, because by this stage, a lot of the senior Nazis had killed themselves through cyanide poisoning, poisoning, so they were very worried that the man would kill himself. And he has a doctor who investigates him, who makes sure he's got no cyanide. And my great uncle, once that has been established, says, listen, you're Rudolf Hoss, the commandant of Auschwitz. And the man says, no, 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 I'm Franz Lang. And he hands over his papers. And he points to the name on the door by the, by the door. And my uncle says, no, no, I've got a photograph of you. You're Rudolf Hoss. And the man says, no, 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 I'm not. And this goes backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. Now, my great uncle, he knew about many of the SS army officers. They put their blood type on their arm. They tattooed it on their arm, so he rolled up the man's sleeve. But Rudolf had been clever. He had taken that tattoo off, so my uncle's like, what am I going to do? And then he says, okay. So he says to his sergeant, he says, go and find me the biggest knife you can find from the, from the, from the kitchen. Because he's seen that the man has a ring on his finger. And being German, he knows that uh, when you get married, you often have the initials or the name of the husband and wife inside the, wedding, inside the ring. And Rudolf Hoss is not going to give him the ring. So he tells his man to get the biggest knife he can from the kitchen. And uh, Rudolf Hoss, seeing that he's going to lose his finger either way, he hands over the wedding ring. And inside, sure enough, is the name Hedwig and Rudolf. So Hans now knows that he's got his man. He puts him in a truck and he drives him back towards the prison. Now, Hans should have taken him straight to the prison for interrogation. This is one of the most wanted men in, uh, in Europe at the time. Uh, but Hans, being Hans, decides instead to go to the pub. And Lee, he leaves Rudolf Hoss with two men in the back of the truck, and they, they, they have a celebration inside the pub. And after a couple of hours, they take, take him out of the truck and they take his clothes off. And to humiliate him, they force him to walk across this big square in Haida. And then he's interrogated inside the prison. And here's a picture of him looking a bit worse for wear after he's being interrogated. But for this is the first time that he confesses that he indeed was the commandant of Auschwitz, that he'd been responsible for the murder of over a million men, women, and children. Well, at that time, the Nuremberg trials were going on. And the Americans were very frustrated because the senior Nazis, the senior members of the SS, the politicians, were denying all knowledge about the camps. They were denying all knowledge about the final solution. And when they heard about the arrest of Rudolf Huss, they sent word to have him transported. So he was taken over to Nuremberg. And he was actually, that's where he, was, uh, he gave testimony at the trial as a witness. He, didn't, he wasn't prosecuted there. He, he appeared as a witness. And the courtroom was stunned to hear his testimony because he gave in abs shocking detail the, de uh, the description of what happened in Auschwitz, the camp, the, death ca the, the gas chambers, the crematoria, the transports. And after that stage, that really changed the momentum of the trial because the other members who are on trial, the other 24 people, the 24 people on trial, they couldn't deny what was happening and that changed the momentum of the trial. Shortly after that, Rudolf Hoss was handed over to the Polish, the Polish government. There was an agreement that war criminals would be tried in the country where the crimes happened, so he was transported to Poland. And while he was waiting for his trial, he wrote his own memoirs. And these memoirs have become a central piece of evidence of the Holocaust. And then finally he was, he was tried, he was found guilty, of course. And then in April 1947, he was hung on a gallows in Auschwitz, next to the old crematoria, and buried in an unmarked grave. Soon afterwards, my uncle went back to Britain. He was demobbed, and he uh, ended up marrying Anne, his, his sweetheart. And behind you can see his father, Alfred, and her father, Pauli, Pauli Greats. You can see they're very happy. And that was it for Hunts. He, uh, he, he didn't join the military intelligence. He didn't become a lawyer like so many of his colleagues. He became a banker, like he had been before the war. 
and he really became involved with the family and the synagogue. Uh, in, in 19, in, in before the war, uh, the German refugees of, of London and Austrian refugees, they set up a synagogue, which is now called Belsize Square Synagogue, and the Alexander family were part of the, the founding uh, of that synagogue, and Hunts was very involved. This is a picture of Hunts and Paul, taken, I think, in the 90s, and you see that they're reading from the Alexander Torah. So the Alexander Torah was the Torah, if you remember, that they had in, in Berlin. And in 1936, they were able to smuggle it out of the country. Because they had it on loan, they still had it in the apartment. And after they came to England, they sent wor word back to their cook, Hilda, and they asked Hilda to send everything uh, in a trunk, and the trunks arrived, and she had literally packed everything. So not just the coats and the blankets, uh, but also there was waste paper baskets full of garbage. <laughs> but also, at the bottom of one of the trunks was the Torah. And so the Belsize Square Synagogue, as it was later called, uh, this was the first Torah of the Belsize Square Synagogue. And for the first 10, 15 years, it was the main Torah of the synagogue. By the time you got to the 90s, however, it had been used so much that it was no longer in very good shape. And they kind of put it, they, they loved it and cherished it and put it to one side. And then during the course of my research about uh, the Torah and the family, we had a discussion with the family about what we should do, and it was agreed to repair the Torah. And so it was sent off to a scribe who spent a, a lot of time uh, fixing it. And then in 2013, it was once again used. And here's a picture of my daughter Sam reading from the Torah during her babetza. So that's the end of the story of Hans and Rudolf, finishing on the family Torah. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you.